hinder you, hinder you. Don't you let where you've been hinder you. Don't let what they've said hinder you. Hinder you. Don't you let your past hinder you. You're a woman without limits. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And uh, so then, fast forward, BB calls me and says, let's me, you, and Carmen do a trio. Mm -hmm. we've, we have duets, we've had uh, quartets, but we've never had a trio. And so we did, and that record is, is 3WB, the Three Winings Brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're in New York, and we have this big day of promotion, and we start ragging each other about the movies. And I said, yeah, you know, people stop me all the time and tell me that they watch and they love me in the movie. <laughs> and so B.B. and Carmen, they're they going to get funny now. Yeah, right. So we're walking down the street and they would stop people and say, have you, have you seen his movie? And, you know, <laughs> do you know him? You know, they just, all day. They're wrong. Oh, yeah, they're wrong. But God will vindicate you. So we go to this, this uh, uh, I think it's serious, serious radio. Uh -huh. And uh, we walk in and we meet this lady that um, B.B. knows. And they friends, they hug. She came over and hugged me and she said, Oh, I watch a movie all the time. It's my favorite movie. I just said, honey, what did you say? What did you say? God. Oh, B.B. was so mad. He was so mad at her. <laughs> You're welcome to Woman Without Limits. Remember, we started something last week. We are continuing again this week an amazing, amazing general of God that God has brought all the way from the United States of America. He has affected generations. I tell you, generation after generation will continue to know this wonderful, wonderful man together with his family. They've been just amazing, profound men and women of God that God has raised to teach and equip the body of Christ. And today we are continuing with the marvelous Bishop Marvin Winans. You're welcome. Thank you.
Oh, wow. So then I started getting scripts for other movies. Yeah. And the one movie had Dolly Parton and, 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 uh, what's Queen Latifah? And they wanted me to play the lead, uh, the husband of, uh, Queen Latifah and whatnot. But I, when I read the script, it was not a positive role of the church. And, it, you know, it wasn't that it was so negative. It's just that I'm a preacher for real. And uh, so I turned it down. And, you know, Kirk Franklin was in that movie and different ones. And I don't feel bad because <laughs> integrity is so important that if you're not true to yourself and if you're not true to God, then then it's all about, it turns into something that becomes all about you. Showbiz. Sure, exactly, and that's, that's not where I'm at. And so Tyler had me come do uh, the, the House of Pain and uh, all that stuff. And I said, Tyler, what are you doing? Just come. And uh, so I, I, I went, and they were doing the shot, and, he, and uh, uh, the husband, is like, because uh, like the Bible say, and without me knowing, I was on the set and we were filming, and I said, what did it say? And everybody broke out laughing. I said, I'm sorry, that wasn't my script. He said, no, 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 you have to do it again. And uh, because that's, that's what we do. If somebody said, like the Bible said, we say, what did it say? You know, and you gotta quote it right. And, uh, but it's, it's that type of uh, sincerity toward God and faithfulness to God that God will open doors and when he opens them no man can close them man. you're preaching this is so powerful so you don't have to jump into everything because it's there you no 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 I, again I'm, I'm giving you some nuggets that I've tried to teach every open door does not mean you go in it Obedience. We go, go back again to obedience. You, yeah, oh yeah. 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 Because wow. the devil, whatever God does, he always comes up with a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be led by the Spirit. The Bible says, when he, the Spirit of truth, John 14, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. Mm -hmm. Tell, tell me something, uh, Bishop. Now that uh, you have another generation of the winans and, and, and they are doing their part, do you think that they are affecting lives like you did or like you still are doing? Um, that next generation, I think they're understanding it now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any appreciation for them, my father was our hero, but he wasn't famous. He worked in the car factory. He uh, had his own barbershop, shoeshine parlor. The Winans, my group, Ronald, Carvin, Marvin, Michael, we made the wine and wines famous, okay? And then BB and CC carried it to another level. And then Daniel, then Angie and Debbie. Then they recorded my mother and father. See, they hadn't recorded before, they, mm. before us. Mm. So then we have children. Right. And our children have to live in the shadow, if you will, if you see it as that, mm. of their parents. Why? Uh, are you going to be greater? And that's the wrong way to look at it. The way to look at it is your parents have built a legacy. Now build on it. What are you doing about it? Yeah, are you building on it? So there was a group called Winans Phase 2. Yes. 
and they did one record which was nominated for a Grammy. They had, because of our relationships, they did a video. The song was recorded by Rodney Jurgens, who at the time was hot as a six shooter. He had recorded Beyonce and uh, Michael Jackson and everybody. He was just huge. And so one day I'm at home and my son, his nickname is Coke. And and let me tell you how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, is, yeah, does it have anything to do with Coke? Coca-Cola, yeah, okay. no. Uh, my father got up because my son is the oldest grandson. He was the first. Wow. And so daddy got up. My nickname is Peanut. Don't ask. It's, I'm, I'm giving Kenya too many family <laughs> secrets. My nickname is, is Peanut. And so my father, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. It was because I was so little. I told you I was the twin that came out. And they said, Lord, look at him. His head looked like a peanut. And then that became my nickname. Because you were little? Yes. Okay. So daddy gets up at church on a Sunday night. I'm not even there. And he's so happy. He said, Lord, my God, Peanut done had a coconut. Wow. So when I came to church, they said, oh, coconut. I said, who is that? They said, your daddy said Peanut had a coconut. I said, oh, no, no, don't even start that. That's not going to happen. Yeah. But it was too late. They called him Coconut. So when he was a little baby, he said, what's your name? He said, my name Totenut. But sometimes they call me Tote. <laughs> and so he just became Cope. And that's his name. That really is his name. Wow. So uh, Cope calls me in about 2 o'clock in the morning. He said, Dad, you sleep? I said, what do you think I'm doing? Mm -hmm. We were out to dinner. And hold on. Our, uh, our producer wants to talk to you. And he got on the phone. He said, hi, hi, Pastor Wines. I said, hello. He said, do you remember me? I said, who are you? He said, I'm Rodney Jurgens." I said, Rodney Jurgens. You that little dark-skinned boy that used to come to our concerts all the time? He yelled on the phone, he remembers me. Because Rodney Jurgens was a little, I mean, when I tell you, he was the cutest little black boy you ever wanted to see. And hence his name, Black Child. And he would, he would get whippings because if the whinings were in town, he was coming. I mean, we'd go to PTL, he would be there. We were in Philadelphia. He lived outside New Jersey. He was in Philadelphia at this big park. And every, whenever we were in that area, we would see him. We would actually look for him. So one day he was on stage. I brought him on stage with us. And uh, he, he did the rap to time. And uh, afterwards, we were in the back. He said, I want to do what you're doing. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. But you got to promise me you're going to give your talent to the Lord. And you're going to only give it to him. He said, yes. His father was a pastor. And I laid hands on him. And I said, Lord, just make him greater. Let the world know his talent. The next thing I know. And I looked at him and said, you didn't keep your promise. <laughs> but he was huge, wow. you know. And so he produced the song on uh, uh, 3WB. I'm sorry, not 3WB, on Winans Phase 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, Winans Phase 2 was Marvin Jr., Carvin Jr., Carvin's brother Juan, and Mike Jr. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they had Samuel L. Jackson in their video. Wow. Okay. Wow. Um, and that was just because. You know, you're mentioning names like a joke, and we had mesmerized here. Oh. <laughs> like, oh my God. Did you just say Tyler Perry? Really? Uh, yes. Did you just say Sissy? What? Yeah. You know? And so, and they only did one record. And then they decided to go their own way. We want to do our own things. Y'all missing the point. And uh, so, uh, you know, they're still young.
Mm-hmm. And God can still, because people have been asking, when are they going to do another record? Right. And so, one, uh, they don't even live in the same place. Carvin mm-hmm. has married, he lives in Australia. Oh. He has two children. Uh, Marvin is, is, is uh, I don't know, I don't know where uh, Juan lives. I think he's in North Carolina. It's just oh, oh, all oh, over. And so, but God is able to, mm-hmm. to do that. So, Do you uh, feel bad about it? Do you think about it? Do you no, think about it? No, I don't yeah. know. They're, they're, once you're grown, you, you get you, to live you your own your life. How mm-hmm. about that? That's so good. Mm-hmm. That's so good. And you have to trust what you put in them. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, how God will do it, it's his business. It's his business. I yeah. don't sweat the details. Right. So you're good. Oh, wow. Um, you want, the, I'm going to ask you just two more and then we're going okay. to we're we're do it. Mm-hmm. Wind up. Um, you had, you were carjacked at one point. Yeah, they told you everything. Huh? <laughs> yeah. How'd that go? Uh... I don't know how to answer that. How did it happen? How did it happen? Was it a good carjacking? Was it a bad carjacking? to give you a glimpse of his majesty. Lord, have mercy. And so God said, this is what I'll do. Moses, this is what I'll do for you. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock. And then I'm going to allow my glory to pass by. And when I'm clean out of your way, I'll remove my hand and let you just get the train. Just get the perfume if you will just get the 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 end of my glory and the bible says that when god passed through the place of the rock that he had prepared when he got through he removed his hand and moses had a glimpse of the glory well he didn't recognize what he had seen until he walked down into the camp When he walked into the camp, the people said, Moses, get away. We can't look at you. You have just been in the presence of God. And the Bible says that Moses had to put a veil over his face just to walk among the people. Now, Pastor Winans, why did you tell me that? It is because when we say, that God puts on his majesty, then there should be a column of smoke. There is a residue. There there is an anointing on your life that is unmistakable and yet identifiable. Now, when you have a God that is so great in majesty that he has to hide you from himself, Then when you say he's in control, you recognize that there's nothing. He's clothed with strength where where he hath girded himself. That means he like dresses up because he's trying to show you who he is. When he gets dressed, he dresses in majesty. And then he puts on his belt. That word gird actually means belt. He puts on his belt and his belt is strength. So we're not messing with some puny God that someone created out of gold or wood. We're dealing with a great God that when he gets dressed, you can't even walk in his closet. He guards himself with strength and then he establishes which means he makes firm he puts it down it is 
properly rooted and erected. It is a perpendicular. It moves up. It is prepared and it is stable and firm. When God does something, he puts it together in a way that no matter what attacks it, it still stands. So tell us about the carjacking that you went through a while ago. Um, I guess it's been three years now. Yeah. Um, I was actually on my way to vet a church that wanted to become a part of PFI in Toledo, Ohio. And, uh, you know, being a pastor, I have a wonderful congregation and they always send people with me and I'm never by myself. And, and this day, I just wanted to be by myself. And so I didn't tell anybody. So, Pastor, you know, don't worry about it. I, I drive myself because Toledo is about an hour away. I would go there, you know, spend the time with the pastor, go to service, and then drive myself back home. So I'm going down the street. I got about a half a tank of gas. And I said, let me get gas. So tonight I won't have to stop. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. 3.20 in the afternoon. And I'm driving uh, west on Davison Street in Detroit. And I see a gas station. And the price of the gas, you know, it's when the price was going up, up, up. And I look to that side, and this gas is six cents more, because I was just going to pull into that gas station. I look across the street, and it's six cents less. So I, I ain't giving nobody six cents, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I turned into that gas station. I walked in, and there had to be no less than 10 to 12 black boys in the gas station. And when I walked in, I said, uh-oh, and I got ready to turn around and walk out, just walk right back on out. And I looked and I messed up because I looked in their faces. And when I looked in their faces, I said, I can't be afraid of us. Other people can be afraid of us, but I can't. And so I stood there and went in my pocket. You know, it was all dumb stuff I should have did. Had this wad of money and I pulled it out and paid for my gas. And when I turned around, I saw this individual look at that individual and they went like, yeah, like we're going to get him. So I come out of the gas station and they came out with me. It was about five of them. And I said, for real? This is really going to happen. So I unhooked the, the gas thing and opened up my door. And then one guy was standing there, another one standing there, another one's hiding behind. This, how can you hide? I saw you go there. And so it was about four or five of them. And he started talking, what you listening to on the radio? I said, come on, y'all. Y'all really? So I looked at him, saw all of the detail, you know, understood. And when I went to take the gas and put it back on this guy come and he hit me in the face and then the other ones came around and they grabbed me and dr drug me away from my my truck it was a q infinity q56 it's a big truck and they grabbed me away from it and then they went to kicking me you know like i like they that like i had taken their car and they went to kicking me and Somebody said, get that money. And when they said that, I put my hand in my pocket. You ain't getting this, <laughs> you know. And then they came and they, they actually ripped. I was indecently exposed. They ripped my pants the way it came off. And, you know, and 
in broad daylight, the sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. Cars going up and down the street and no one stopped. And they got in the truck and they left. With your truck? With my truck and my briefcase. And, um, and I got up. I had some nice glasses. I don't know where them glasses went. Um, a lady then pulled up and rolled down the window and said, Pastor Winans, are you okay? I said, yeah. Just take me to back to my church because I was just five minutes away from the church. And I said, can I use your phone? I called the church because I didn't want anybody to know. And But the police, someone had already called the police. And when I got in the car, uh, when we called the police, they said they knew. I, I, I called and they had dispatched a unit to the church. And I had some more clothes at the church, so I went, changed my clothes, and the school was in session. And, you know, someone knows someone and that's on the police force, and they had called somebody. And my, my assistant principal that came down said, all right, they was on their way to the I said, no. And I came back, and the police said, where did it happen? And I said, let's go. And we went. By then, Channel 7 News had found out it was a breaking story. We went back to the gas station, and you couldn't get in the gas station. People had come from everywhere to see about me, yeah. you know. And I was fine. Just this finger was kind of had a, a, a hair fracture. Mm. The bone was just fractured, but it wasn't anything. Mm. And so Channel 7 News, the police, they had all come out there. The community had come out. <laughs> One guy said, Pastor Wiles, don't worry about it. We're going to get him. We'll get them tonight. You don't do that to you. <laughs> and I said, don't worry about it, you know. And, uh, and uh, so... I never feared for my life, ever, because uh, I knew I was in God's hand. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm the kind of guy I said, Lord, why? Why did this happen? And even though we have a school and we had it for, at that time, maybe, maybe 12, 13 years, um, K through 12th grade, I said, maybe I'm not doing enough. So I said, Lord, what do we do? And we launched uh, Operation Gas Station, where we started going into the gas station witnessing the people. Um, and uh, they took my truck, and that was, what, on a Wednesday? That was on a Wednesday. By Friday, I had my truck back. Mm. And all they did was wash it. The, the man on the news said, this is the most famous truck in Detroit right now. It, it was trending. Uh, and they, and they, they cleaned it up and hit it. One guy called his grandmother that had, was in the assault, called his grandmother and apologized and said, we didn't know it was passed away. Um, not that it should happen to anyone, but it was that kind of reaction. And I said, Lord, I guess we're not doing enough. Wow. But other than so that, it I'm, actually caused you to now go and witness to mm -hmm. So souls were won out after of that. Their Absolutely. Wow, that's that's really awesome. Tell me, um, uh, Bishop, what would be your your parting shot? What would you tell um, people in Kenya that are really trusting in God to move from where they are to where they ought to be? I see, uh, and it seems to be replete in Kenya and in the whole of Africa, that Africa is such a beautiful continent, 
And it seems as if God just downloaded to make this the richest continent on earth. Um, from minerals to precious stones to the pineapples. They are, they're heavenly. They are. The pineapples are heavenly. What I would say mm -hmm. is your past doesn't have to be your future. Understanding historically how other nations colonized you, made you slaves and subservient to them, you can't not allow that spirit to exist and make you learn the bad habits of other nations. Kenya has to care about Kenyans. The government that you have has to be connected, concerned about the whole of the country. Not just a certain tribe, not just the wealth of a certain family. If not, you will continue the cyclical deprivation of a nation. I say that because I think it is the place of the church to lead the charge. For if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked God says, then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive your sin, that's personal, but then I'll heal your land. Mm. That's corporate and community. Right. And so the church has to come together and make the mandate, put the pressure on the politicians. The the preacher can't follow the politician. The politician has to follow the preacher. The prophetic voice wow. in this nation has to lead. The governmental voice has to imply what has been spoken by the prophet. So that's what I would say. I would pray that Kenyans would uh, understand that uh, because this is your land. And... Uh, I would be happy to come back and see that happening. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's really, really awesome. And it's so wonderful to have you in Kenya. <laughs> You're such a blessing. We are looking forward to tonight. Tonight we're going to have a move of God. We're going to Yes. I believe so. <laughs> I believe so. Well, there you are. You're watching Woman Without Limits. May the good Lord bless you. This is all the time we have for today. May God bless you and keep you. Keep your calls coming. <laughs>
not like it's a popular song, but like it's a personal song. Oh, I wish I had some people that made noise in here. You gotta sing. We are the chosen generation. Call for to show his excellence. All I require for life, God has given me. I know. What is so interesting is that the agnostic will say, where did God come from? Who created God? That is because as human beings, we have to deal with time. And so in order for us to comprehend it, it has to have a beginning and an end. But God lives outside of the restraints of time. God is unaffected by time. God is no older now than he was when he created the world. He's not some old man in heaven upset with young people. <laughs> He's uninfluenced by time we have a beginning and we have an end so in order for us to understand him he calls himself alpha and omega he's the beginning he's the end he's the first and he's the last so to understand God is that he feels every tense of time. He's yesterday, he's today, he's tomorrow, and he doesn't move from where he is. So God has the ability to back up into your future. I'm gonna let y'all think about that a moment. He has the ability to move into your past and remain where he is. So when we talk about God establishing something of old, when people try to compare their breakthrough to disprove God, it only proves him more. So when we talk about, oh, I just saw a star and we sent a telescope in the universe and we see other universes and we see other worlds and stars that are burning and birthing at the same time. I say, thank you, Jesus, because he never stopped doing what he does. The Bible says in Hebrew, through faith, we know that the worlds with an S were framed by the word of God. God is ever moving. That's the reason in Genesis, he says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. In the Hebrew, it simply says, and God says, be light, was light. So whenever God speaks, it happens when he says it. His word has the ability to establish something. So when you come to God, Lord, I feel like preaching now. When you come to God, God has already planned before you ever got there. That's the reason when Jeremiah stood up and began to tell God how young he was and that he wasn't able to do what he was able to do. God said, don't tell me that anymore because guess what, Jerry? Before I formed you, 
in your mother's belly. I had already known you. Before you came out, I had already held an ordination service. I had already sanctified you and made you a prophet to the nation. So what I want you to understand that when God says he's clothed in majesty, that he puts on his belt of strength, that he has spoken something and he has established something, you need to know that God did it way before you got here. Now the glory of that is it can't be moved. Is our God sing with me how I show all of my days. Is our God and all will see how great how great Without 